Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is David Seambeck, Lead Industry and Service Officer from the Asian Productive Organization. Thank you for joining our productive talk today. I would like to introduce Professor Waldemar Fertschi from Germany, who is a Senior Marketing Professor at Cyprus International Institute of Management. Thank you, David, for making me a part of your presentation. I'm very pleased to be here and would like to share my slides. Today, we work for the Asian Productivity Organization, and I am very pleased I could be part of that. And the topic we are covering is productive stakeholder engagement, applying H2H -H marketing. And I'm very happy to be part of that. I'm currently in um, Albania at Epoca University and also teaching at the um, Cyprus International Institute of Management. Um, uh, and I would like to introduce myself um, a little bit more because my personal development and the development of the marketing uh, um, the, uh, theories and concepts are highly interconnected. Um, I started my learning at the Free University in Berlin, uh, became assistant professor at the Technical University there and did uh, quite interesting projects in uh, renewable energy and uh, applied technologies. Um, then uh, I moved into the industry after being uh, working for the UN in Africa, as we just spoke about. Um, afterwards, um, I joined the consulting area and I was a partner as Arthur Anderson and L.E.K. Um, afterwards, I was going to teach at the Fordsheim Business School, which is a small business school close to Stuttgart, specialized in marketing and international business. And uh, in, in between, I was in China at the CEIBS, China European International Business School, and that was very interesting for me to see the development there. Now I'm teaching at Epoca and CIMM. From the beginning of my career, I was very much involved in internationalization um, at the, uh, uh, in Berlin and uh, with Siemens, within Siemens and then also in the uh, consulting area. Then I moved to B2B marketing, which is actually very much related to international business because 80% of all um, B2B uh, activities are international. And uh, there came a lot, a big stream of research out of that. And today I'm working together with Phil Kotler and other authors in the H2H uh, -H marketing area. And I believe this will be part of the future thinking of marketing. Uh, I had a couple of publications which I would like to mention here. The most important one is B2B brand management uh, with Phil Kotler, which uh, really changed the thinking and the activities of many industrial companies. It came out in 2006. And when you look at the uh, um, brand value of uh, B2B companies in that time, it really, uh, the, this value skyrocketed from that time. Uh, now we're living in the, in the meantime, I also had a book which was called uh, B2B2C or Ingredient Branding, which uh, enlarged the scope. And finally, in this year, Phil and Uwe and myself published the H2H Marketing Project, um, which hopefully can have a major impact on the development of the marketing thinking. Well, if we start with the important aspects of the change in the last couple of years, I think we have to look at uh, a development like the uh, Davos Manifesto from the uh, World Economic Forum. And that manifesto was also part of our publication because uh, in that manifesto, um, it was stated that companies serve its customer that company treats its people, a company considers suppliers, a company serves society, a company provides uh, uh, for the shareholders, a company is more than an economic unit, and so on. I mean, these are very important aspects which were stated uh, last year. Uh, a huge uh, progress has been made in the meantime. Many companies have uh, uh, signed up and working in this area to consider this kind of 
thinking. Of course, the coronavirus has uh, impacted that thing, but nevertheless, in the current situation of the fourth industrial revolution, where um, uh, the cyber physical systems are becoming a reality, uh, the new thinking, I think, um, will determine many of our future activities. Um, <clears throat> I also integrated some of the important thinkers of this world and some of this is app and Shed, Jack Shed in his sustainability edge. He looked at the stakeholder approach and we believe in the age to age marketing that the stakeholder approach is actually the approach which is necessary to consider. And when you look at the various impacts that the stakeholder or that the company has on its stakeholders, we see the direct impact, which meaning where there are people concrete affected by them, then the impact on the indirect way, and then an enabler impact to various other aspects of the um, uh, partners. Of course, the consumers are the most impacted one, um, but uh, we also should not forget the influence on, uh, on the customers, which could be very different, and the employees, uh, because uh, all of that really is uh, completely interconnected. Uh, indirect impacts we have on governments and media and NGOs. And uh, when you look at the enabler impacts, of course, it's suppliers, investors, and also communities. So this kind of um, 360 degree stakeholder model um, uh, we in incorporated in the thinking of the uh, H2H marketing, and it can have all this impact, what is necessary to change the world. Well, when you look at the changing in uh, uh, the demands for the future, I would like to highlight uh, uh, an analysis which has been done uh, uh, two years ago in the U.S., and it analyzed how shoppers behave. And uh, we took out two important questions. The first one was, is it extremely or very important for me that companies implement programs to improve the environment? I mean, this is a question which you ask if somebody, if you want to know from somebody if uh, they're really uh, considering sustainability as important. And when you look at people like myself, I'm a baby boomer. Of course, we think this is good. Not all of them, but 62% in the US have said that they will care about that. Uh, Gen X, uh, 66. The important thing is that actually the young people, the millennials, are at the, the 83 level. So there are only a few ones who don't think it's important. On a global average level, it's 81%. So what we see is that the, the difference between the older and the younger ones are actually very visible. Well, that's nice. But then, of course, the major question is, I definitely or probably will change my purchasing or consumption habit to reduce my impact on the environment. That means, do I really do something? And when we talk about change, this is actually important. And uh, as we know, baby boomers like myself, we may uh, look at the uh, uh, energy reduction or driving an electrical car or something like this. But it's actually a very small unit of people who are doing that. Um, the Gen X are a little bit higher. I mean, uh, more than 10% higher. But the millennials are at 7%, 75% level on the, and the global level is 73. So the consequences out of this kind of behavior change are enormous. So if we um, really think that is a trend which will continue, we, I think many companies have to follow um, this kind of requirement because the customer will not buy their other products in a couple of years. So this impact is actually very important. In addition, we had the coronavirus and the coronavirus really changed uh, uh, consumer patterns and consumer behavior. We are not through yet. Um, and the new version, the new variant uh, may also have another impact and there could come even more. Um, so the behavior on mobility, the behavior on consumption, the behavior on interaction with people very much has changed and also will impact 
um, the performance of many companies. And therefore, companies need to be um, aware and need to follow this kind of activities. But because if they don't follow, there may be history. Well, when you look at the stages of um, age to age uh, orientation, you can see you can say that there are benefits for marketeers and there are benefits for consumers, and all of them has to be considered. And if you have an axis on low and high to, uh, on the left side and on the right side, um, you could characterize the existing company behavior in the, in that. Uh, uh, dimensions. And of course, if uh, the benefit of the marketeers and the consumers are low, we talk about wasteful marketing. So you don't do the right things what you should do. And there is also some kind of unethical marketing, which means that companies are actually taking advantage. We see that in some areas, particularly in the oligopolic kind of uh, structures, when companies are having a major impact or major inroad into uh, consumer behaviors, um, when they um, take advantage and uh, the consumer cannot react. So this is considered as some kind of unethical behavior, which I think is not good. I also think that it's not good when the company doesn't benefit from it. So if the customers are actually having most of that. Somehow in the middle there, I think, is the truth. So here, uh, companies like Patagonia are showing that there is a real space for human-to-human -human marketing where you care about the environment, where you produce products which are fitting to the situation. Um, the famous uh, campaign from Patagonia, don't buy this jacket, um, went through uh, the press very often, and people understood after a while the basic concept behind Patagonia. There are other companies uh, in the industrial area. I'm just taking one from Germany, which is called Dürr, who really cares about the environment. It's building machinery for the improvement and with very uh, ecological uh, high standards. A well-known company is Whole Foods in the U.S., who is providing uh, biological graded food to customers in a way that they really care about their uh, the benefits for the customer, the benefits for the employees and the suppliers in a whole. So this kind of positive examples are actually um, uh, available today. There are many more. Um, some of them are doing it without knowing us from us, but I think there's a increased role of um, companies who are really considering um, the stakeholders as part of their conceptual um, doing. When we look at the involvement of the marketing theory in the last uh, 100 years, of course, we had lots of uh, thinking at the beginning, starting with the national economics concept, moving on to marketing theory and contextual theory, uh, which ended up in some kind of uh, diversion between distribution um, orientation and classical sales theory in the 40s, and then moved on to various uh, specialized areas where we do today talk about digital value orientation, uh, or we talk about new modern approaches, particularly in the 60s and 80s, where the B2C um, uh, activities were become part of the marketing theory. From the 80s, the B2B area was also included in new paradigmas. And these new paradigmas are actually also include the stakeholder thinking um, at the current level. In addition, we discovered that there have been new impacts of concepts, which have been not too much considered in the broad uh, marketing theory, and therefore we have included them. One of them is design thinking. Design thinking has been used by designers and product developers, but in the last couple of years, it was it's actually moved mainstream and became major part of innovative products in companies. Um, Apple, Intel, GE, Siemens. I mean, all the larger companies have discovered that with design thinking, you actually can 
<clears throat> come up with new solution and think better about new innovations for a new product and solution. And that we would like to include in the new thinking of marketing. In addition, there has been a new uh, concept, which is called service dominant logic, which puts the service orientation of um, the uh, company offering in the forefront. Uh, it comes from the goods dominant logic where companies are producing goods and the customer destroys them. Actually, the service dominant logic sees it differently. And we would like to put this concept into the new marketing thinking because when you have the concept that the customer creates value with your product, you actually do a very different offer, offering. In addition, uh, the digitalization is here to stay. Um, it may have started in the uh, 80s. Actually, I personally sent my first email in 1987 and uh, had my first uh, computers also in the 80s. Um, and it is here to stay. And then digitalization really has changed our world, has changed the products are designed, has changed how products interact, and has changed how people are doing this. So the outcome of that is that the new concept of H2H marketing is built on the newer paradigmas in the marketing theory and adds design thinking, service dominant logic, and digitalization, including the stakeholder concept. So that evolution of the marketing theory leads us to um, a more detailed look of the influencing factor in the H2H uh, marketing. And um, as I said, the design thinking is uh, a major part of that, service dominant logic, digitalization, that all comes together into the new marketing model. And that marketing model is actually built in detail on uh, design thinking, which is human-centered. It has a human-centered mindset, and that mindset actually is um, transferred to the whole marketing thinking. Marketing is considered as experimental, as in the design thinking. It has an iterative, innovative innovation process, and we would like to see that process in many of the marketing activities which then meets, that means that the products are being continuously improved and upgraded. And of course, marketing is based on deep customer insights because with the design thinking, you really go deep into the things what the customers feel and do. In addition, as I mentioned before, the service dominant logic, which is the conceptual foundation and uh, sees value co-creation in the center of the collaborative ecosystem where all the partners are working together and creating together value for themselves and the customer. In addition, um, customer experience, CX, um, is from eminent importance because the CX reflects what is actually happening with the value creation on all the levels. Finally, the digitalization as technical prerequisite for the H2H marketing. It has the trend of continuous dematerialization. And, and in addition, there's a very important aspect in the digitalization, which is the increasing importance of trust, uh, since the distances between people um, are getting larger in terms of uh, uh, electronic space. You, there is a high need that trust is reestablished. And if there is no trust, uh, actions are actually not happening. And therefore, uh, companies need to know that uh, the trust issue is actually one of the really big aspects of the new world. And all the companies who are uh, missing out on that may be in trouble for some time. <clears throat> in addition, there are some... Um, uh, corresponding management layers in the H2H marketing concept. One of them is the mindset, uh, which is the normative management. It is sustaining and justifying what you're doing. 
It's also the H2H management, which is strategic management, which aligns and adjusts the activities of the company and the process. And the process is the operational management part, which executes and implements the concept. So all together gives the H2H marketing model, where design thinking, service dominant logic, digitalization, build the foundation for the marketing, and then the mindset and the management and the processes making up the other elements of this model. And by implementing that in the in stakeholder thinking, it uh, gives the company the opportunity to really move in a very different direction of their whole marketing activities. Well, there are various uh, factors for determining the mindset because I think the mindset is one of the really important part, the way companies and individuals are thinking about the things, what they're doing. And therefore, I would like to mention it here. The design thinking gives us the human-centered approach. So you can orient yourself more on the things what people want if you're using design thinking. You can experiment or you can use the methods of the design thinking in your marketing. The design thinking gives you the opportunity to really embrace the empathy, see how you are connected and what effects your connection had, and in addition, the collaboration with the various factors. So having an H to H mindset and using the design thinking as basis gives you really the opportunity to get close to the people and the people of the various layers of the stakeholder concept. So not only the consumers, but also the employees, the community, and also um, suppliers and other parties of the stakeholder area. In the digitalization, we have the interconnected thinking, which means people can think all the time together Keep, you know, people can use resources, people can interconnect. They have a high degree of agility, very speedy interaction. And there's a very important part, which I really need to uh, emphasize, is the priority of human over machine. Well, the machines become more and more powerful. But of course, the final saying still today is the human. And of course, the human can give algorithm or mechanism which are drifting away from the really important purposes of life. Um, and therefore it is necessary that uh, the management has to set priorities of human over machine. In the service dominant logic, the uh, impact, the, uh, the impact onto the mindset is of course the service orientation and uh, that the value of the customer is not by the destroyed by the customer, it's actually created, it's co-created together. I offer um, a value proposition from the company side and the, com the, the customer is using it. I mean, if you use, for example, the example from IKEA, where IKEA is offering a set of um, furniture components which are put together by the customer. And of course, the customer can co-created in his way, in her way, um, but also it can actually be done by a service organization, whatever is possible, but the co-creation is a major part of the thinking. Well, in the concept, uh, I mean, this is not only true in companies like IKEA, but also uh, in company like Whole Food. I have here an example of Whole Food where they have and um, uh, declaration of interdependence, which I think is a great example of this kind of concept. And the whole fool stated in this uh, uh, concept, it's a couple of pages long, uh, various factors. I would like to mention a few one. One is the, um, uh, the overriding purpose. Our purpose is to nourish people and the planet, which means that's not only the people who wish are served, but also the people who are around. So they actually look around uh, and have an impact and try to have an impact on the other aspects of their business. So it's not only the focus only on their own business, but also around. The next thing is 
um, we satisfy and delight our customer. I think that should be in the center of every company. But at the same time, they say we practice win, win partnership with our suppliers. So they don't put the suppliers um, into a, um, a lower position. They want them on the same level. They want them to benefit also. In addition, we care about our communities and environment. And I think this is really a great example of stakeholder um, uh, orientation. And there are many aspects more to these things, but I think these are the most important from my side. And I would like to share them with you because I believe this is a good example of um, age to age marketing and stakeholder orientation. Well, I'm using here the spike shareholder model from uh, Jacques Chet. Uh, he used it uh, in various books, as we said at the beginning uh, also. Um, and his model puts the firms of endearment in the middle. Uh, firms of endearment are very similar to H2H to -H companies. Actually, the list is almost compatible. Um, and the factors which he stresses are similar to the one customer, employees, society, partners, and investors. And that uh, SPICE model um, we are using also to build the impact to other stake to the stakeholders to the H to H model, and therefore integrating the sustainable edge and the firm of endearment into the H to H approach. So having the direct, indirect, and enabler impact and the various factors around and putting H to H marketing as an overriding principle to it integrates these um, two approaches. And I believe with this integrated approach, there could be quite an interesting development and a development for the better of the world. And um, there is also the principle of the bullseye, which uh, uh, characterizes the distances of the individual. And uh, these distances could be overcome uh, by various activities. So if you have a decreasing concern, then of course, uh, the impact is less. But if you really consider the human in the middle, then you can see and affect all the others in with your activity. So using the bull eye principle is something what I like to recommend because I think if we all do this and involve our activities more centered around all the stakeholders, we can actually see a new resonance-based society. So when we go back in the uh, development over the last um, two centuries, we had the agricultural society and the industrial-based society. And today we live in the more or less called knowledge-based society. And we could move um, to what we call here resonance-based society. There could be other terms to characterize that. But we think with the impact of h to h marketing, uh, we can actually transform our society, our companies, and also our well-being of the people um, to a much better situation. Thank you very much. And if you have some more questions, send me a mail. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Professor. I would like to ask you some questions. It is easy to say that people are more important than the products we engineer or the profits we make. The biggest challenge boils down to how we can convince digital makers to change their mindset about this. When some of them see products or profits as most important while disregarding trust and empathy altogether. Well, this is a very good question. Thank you, David. Um, I mean, as a marketing professor, um, the power of what you have is your words, is your concepts, and of course, the way you live. But I also think that the time we are in now, the conscious managers, the conscious leaders actually can convince themselves. They see what is happening. They see what impact certain companies have, like uh, uh, Whole Foods, which I mentioned. So I think 
they can convince themselves. Of course, it helps when they read uh, articles, books, listen to speeches like this. Um, but I think um, there's a quite an important part that there's a exchange between the leaders. And I mentioned the uh, World Economic Forum as one of these forums who will make this happen. I think we need more of them and maybe APO can start this kind of dialogue also. And um, the other part of that is actually listening to the customers, seeing what the customer want. Of course, in this situation where we are now, where Corona is distorting behavior, where Corona is making the people nervous, where uh, there are pretty unusual things. Um, I see that in my students, when they come to class after being locked up for a year, they act very differently. So I think um, in this special times, um, number one, we have to listen, but also we have to have this kind of vision I mean, when you look at companies like Apple or Metaverse now, they have um, an idea, they see what is possible. And then, of course, when talking to their peers, I think um, if the atmosphere, what we have in the business community is geared more to the better of the whole uh, universe, then the convincing is done by itself. Of course, it helps when there is government regulation. It helps if a uh, uh, supranational institution like the UN uh, is stepping in. Um, but I think it's a multi-faceted activity. And uh, number one, we have to be patient. But number two, we also have to be direct and tell the, uh, the world that there is time to do something for everybody. The age to age mindset sounds right, as some companies and marketeers might use uh, human centricity for its own sake, since it is a comforting concept. But there is sometimes a disturbing disregard for human welfare and will social justice beneath the surface level promises of progressiveness. Uh, what is your take on that, Professor? Are there many companies claiming human centric motives simply to preserve or increase their profit margins? Hi, David. This is a difficult question. And um, um, it's very hard to predict and to measure that. Um, I would like to quote um, Andrew Grove, uh, who said in his book, Only the Paranoid Survive. Um, business fail either because they leave their customers or because their customer leave them. And this is actually an interesting quote concerning to your question. Um, because, I mean, when you look at the failures of the last 10 years, and we have a couple of them, I mean, Blockbuster, for example, um, the customer just walked away. Yeah? Or when you look at the uh, parts of the uh, uh, financial uh, disasters, AIG and uh, Lehman Brothers, I mean, uh, of course, there's some crisis situations, but nevertheless, these crisis situations uh, triggered certain uh, effects. And uh, when customers are showing that they are doing something different, I mean, currently under the coronavirus, many customers don't travel. They would love to travel, uh, which means lots of businesses in trouble. Um, government stepped in to, uh, to, to, to ease the situation. But nevertheless, I mean, um, when the companies see that the customer reacts, and I'll give you the example of Tesla. I mean, Tesla was a small company and Tesla um, created a product which has some interesting features. Of course, they are alternatives like hydrogen. Um, there are other possibilities to save uh, energy, to be fuel efficient. But when the customer reacted, and I still remember March 2016, when Tesla outperformed in the US the sale of the Mercedes S-Class. 
So more Model S were sold in one month than S-Class in the US. This was actually the triggering point where Mercedes-Benz understood they have to change their concept. They were putting all the emphasis on uh, clean diesel and uh, efficient uh, petrol cars, but then they changed. Finally, this year, they came with a complete fleet uh, of uh, models, electrical, hybrid, uh, uh, conventional. And uh, as you may know, the German government wants to phase out um, petrol combustion engine cars till 2035. So they are ready to do that because they have everything in the stall. Actually, they had everything ready 10 years ago, uh, but they were hesitant. But after the customer really gave them the signal, and I mean, the S-Class is the flagship of uh, uh, this brand, um, they reacted. So that is my um, statement or my insight, which I got from the, the demand possibilities or the, 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 the shift of customer needs. And if companies understand that, they follow or even progress. And uh, I think um, the power of the customer, and we are in a, a very specific market situation, is here. And therefore, we can see the chain, change. And if customers uh, put their demands forward and companies are reacting or even taking it up, uh, there will be a change pretty soon. Digitalization can contribute very positively to age stage marketing. For instance, AI and neuroscience marketing can improve the customer experience. Can you elaborate on the relationship among AI, trust, and empathy? How can digitalization add more to enhancing the customer experience? Right. I mean, AI and customer experience uh, uh, sounds like a contradiction, but actually it is not. Um, we see more and more mechanism where... Uh, electronic interaction um, is supported by artificial intelligence. And actually, I think from my personal standpoint, that artificial intelligence is enhancing our way of interact and is helping the customer. But of course, the final decision, the final uh, saying has to be, number one, the, the individual, and number two, the decider, and not the AI, not the technology itself. So I think if we enhance the possibility of AI, and we actually have other technologies, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, holograms, uh, there is much more to come and integrate that into our uh, normal life, then the customer experience can be enhanced. Of course, there's a big question of empathy. Yeah, is the empathy given or not? Um, and AI can work on that. But nevertheless, the human empathy is still the most dominant and overriding principle. So I think companies have to make sure that, of course, the uh, artificial intelligence and other uh, systems can assist them, but also uh, the final decision should be made by the humans. Regardless of the research method used, like a neuroscience, data mining based on purchase history and surveys, consumers may feel that their privacy is being violated, particularly when it seems that a company somehow knows more about them and what they want to buy than they know themselves. Do you think that efforts to maximize the customer experience through technology and digitalization may be misused to trigger the buy button? We have seen the misuse and uh, we experienced the misuse um, and similar like uh, reacting to spam activities in the internet. I think customer can also react to that. Nevertheless, I think there is another dimension here necessary to consider. It's actually the legal or government uh, in enforced uh, situation. So I think it's... Um, also necessary beside the watch of the consumers, the, the, the critical uh, consideration of that, to give institutions uh, like regulators the possibility to step in. 
And um, in the last couple of years, we have seen quite an interesting development where unregulated, uncontrolled uh, things actually go into the wrong direction. And um, therefore, I think there is also a need of regulations. I don't want to step into the discussion of cyber currency, um, which is a separate one. Nevertheless, it's pretty close to the things we're discussing here. And um, we have not found uh, uh, a standard. We have not found an international understanding on that. Um, China is acting differently than the West. Uh, some countries are moving forward. But nevertheless, I think uh, governments have a role here. And the consumer watchdogs and other institutions need to support um, the uh, interest of the, support, uh, of the customers again. Companies can violate that and can use that. But in the long term, my understanding is that actually the customers who are making decisions can counteract and, um, and also defend themselves and come to a situation which is hopefully long, long term better. So the interaction between uh, regulatory and uh, uh, watchdogs and uh, consumer behavior may lead to a better situation. Professor Pilek Kotler emphasized the importance of a stakeholder centricity over shareholder centricity. This is also closely related to forms of endearment, which do not benefit one stakeholder group at the expense of any other. Bill Marriott said, take good care of the employees and they will in turn take good care of the customers who will return again and again. Businesses that embrace sustainability contribute positively to all their stakeholders. How can you incorporate this thinking into H to H marketing? I think uh, this shareholder centricity is a fundamental part of the H to H marketing. The challenge is actually to make it happen. So the implementation of this concept, um, there could be some voluntary activities, that there could be some single acted activities, but putting them into the hard core of the company. Um, I do remember the Google saying, don't do evil. And uh, this was highly publicized. In the meantime, Google has changed and Google has become alphabet. Um, and uh, and uh, there are quite uh, different activities going on. Nevertheless, if the inner thinking of a company is oriented to we are doing good. And I mentioned Patagonia, I stressed uh, uh, Whole Foods. There are many more companies out, YKK from Japan, I like to mention this kind of company. Um, they are really putting this kind of thinking in the forefront of their activities. And when that is stated, and every employee and every customer understands that, Number one, there's a complete higher level of loyalty. Number two, all the thinking of the customer comes back to the company. So the innovation rate could be higher. The, um, the uh, service uh, uh, interaction with the customer could be better. So I think both sides can benefit from that. So my take on that is companies should not only think about the integration of the stakeholder concept, they should actively do it. And they have to face this kind of uh, difficulties. But nevertheless, if they embrace it, it will bring them, their customer, and their whole ecosystem on a higher level. Okay. So With you've made a difficult sentence here. <laughs> <laughs> With a shift from product centricity to service centeredness, experiential co creation of value becomes the new reality. Can you explain why experiential co creation of value is becoming more important? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the speed we are living today is enormous. With the globalization, everything 24 hours around the globe is possible. The new means of transportation, aircraft, containers, uh, 3D printing, internet, technology change, all that kind of things really uh, uh, change the world. I mean, you look at fast fashion. I mean, uh, uh, a company like Indidex, which is known as Sara and other brands, has, has changed 
the thing of co-creation. Their offerings are instantly created and instantly used. And of course, there are some negative aspect to that. But nevertheless, this is an example of complete change. I mean, we could go into financial center, uh, sectors and would, could mention Goldman Sachs or other companies who have the similar speed of reaction. And of course, there are here are also some questions, who is taking advantage of whom? But nevertheless, this change and this applying of this change really came up with some new uh, uh, creation of value. And it's not only the creation for themselves, but also together with the other one in the fashion area, in the financial areas. So it is possible. And I mean, if you look at um, Apple with the uh, introduction of the iPhone, they did the integration of internet, music, uh, and telephone in a way that the value of the people who are using that kind of service are complete fantastic. As you explained it very well, stakeholder engagement is more important than shareholder centricity alone. But it is also true that it can be very difficult to satisfy stakeholders who have conflicting interests. Is there any silver bullet to engage stakeholders more successfully through H to H marketing? Well, silver bullets are rare. Um, I just mentioned Apple. Apple had a couple of silver bullets. One thing I would like to mention, which is uh, not often mentioned, is actually the invention of apps. I mean, uh, the apps were around uh, and similar, like the MP3 player, they branded it, they put it on the forefront. But the principle of app gives actually the possibility to joint co-creation, the system providers, the developers, the customers, the communities, everybody actually participates on this kind of uh, stakeholder concept. And of course, there are some conflicting and sometimes they are overlapping and sometimes they are uh, uh, disturbing uh, situations. But I think on that example, you can see how many entities are actually creating value on different layers for different purposes with, together with the customer and with the other partners in the system. There are many more things uh, what we could see here, but I think that is a really good example uh, where it could happen. Of course, finding this kind of silver bullets is pretty hard, uh, but I think um, in the speed of innovation, what we have currently, this is to expect to see more in the future. Many companies talk about the importance of empathy, humanity centricity, and stakeholder centricity in the early stages. However, as time goes by and as they grow, they tend to become more bureaucratic and internally political and may forget their original principles and values. How can this problem be addressed, Professor? Well, very interesting question. Um, of course, small companies are closer because it's small to small people. Um, but, uh, but we know even small companies could be large, remember? Uh, uh, WhatsApp was 17 people <laughs> when they uh, were sold um, and had a uh, uh, 100 million uh, customers. Um, but I think the most important aspect to this is the mindset. With what kind of mindset are you actually approaching your activities? And if you have a human-oriented mindset, you are actually organizing you will contact your activities more in a human-centered way. And um, you can check your mindset. Are you more interested in finances? You are more interested in technology? Are you more interested in uh, processes or into human? And you will also get the feedback from the customers. Of course, um, it is difficult really to figure out what the customer's uh, reaction is. But nevertheless, if you want to do the things right, you should ask yourself, what do I think? Do I have a flexible mindset? Do I have a mindset which is oriented to the things what people want? And of course, if you apply techniques like design thinking, um, you will relatively easy find out what is possible and what is not possible. 
Um, the way you design your products, the way you deliver the product, the way you um, uh, interact, the way you service them. And of course, you could do it in a strictly financial oriented way and say, okay, you're not paying, so we don't serve you. Or you do it in a way uh, that the, actually the interaction is meaningful and uh, maintains the customer relationship. So I think checking what you're thinking, checking if you have a human-oriented mindset is actually very helpful. So marketers believe that because customers do not know the solutions to their problems, experts are needed to come up with them. What is your take on that? The experts are right. Yeah. Large groups of people may not know what they particularly want. Yeah, we know that. And uh, companies and governments have uh, guiding roles. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we have to understand um, where the, in which direction things are going and, uh, and um, what is the, actually the right thing to do. This is always a question which you have to self, ask yourself. And here you have to take your own judgment. I mean, we are humans. We can say what is good or not. So I think companies have the opportunity to say, this is good. That's why I'm doing it. This is not so good. Yeah? And this kind of moral compass should be used. And I'm not saying you have to do it. But I think in the world we are living, um, there, is, there are many options. And therefore, I think you have the option to do it right. And it's your choice. From my perspective, it's everybody's choice to go in the direction where we can improve our situation, the situation of many people, and maintain a healthy global environment. Many companies fail, not only because they don't have a human-centered mindset, but also because they only see customers as buyers instead of as uh, stakeholders. Unless they have the human-centered mindset, they cannot benefit from design thinking, digitalization, and service dominant logic. How can you nurture this human-centered mindset when there is a still a tendency to dehumanize and objectify people, seeing them as uh, expendable cogs in an overall machine? When you look at the zombie-like movies, they may foster this kind of picture. But there are many reasons why companies are failing. Uh, technology, crisis, complacency. Um, the H2H -H marketing concept is not a concept to avoid failing. But it is a concept to give you some guidance. And the guidance does not... Uh, take away your responsibility. They, they look at your finances, they look at your processes, you look at your efficiency, but it tells you in which direction your efficiency, your activities, and your interaction with the customer goes. Of course, everything starts with the innovation and the people which you have in your company and the people, how you nurture them. But nevertheless, I think with this kind of new concept, you can guide your people, you can guide the innovation, you can guide the activities on the market. Nevertheless, you have to be careful. Nevertheless, you have to look at your finances. Nevertheless, you have to be uh, sometimes very strict in, uh, in uh, how you organize things. So it is actually, it will be a balance between what you could do and what you can do. And sometimes uh, I think there are some backslashes and there are some compromises you have to do. But of course, I think if you offer something what people really want, uh, there will be a market and there will be a profit. Professor, do you have any closing remark for our viewers? Well, thank you very much for letting me participate. At that talk, I think uh, your organization is uh, a good organization for conveying this kind of message because you're oriented on the spread of productivity. Productivity is very important, but of course, from my perspective, the proper productivity has to have a purpose. And this is actually what we are trying to say with the H2H -H marketing concept that you should continue to do the things what you have done, 
but you may look back and you may uh, should think about why do I do it? Whom do I give a benefit? And what is the outcome? What does it mean for the world? And therefore, if you incorporate that kind of thinking in your productivity enhancement, I think the outcome will be better. Vielen Dank, dass Sie Ihre Erkenntnisse heute geteilt haben, Professor Waldemar. Thank you so much for sharing your insights today, Professor Waldemar. Viewers, thank you for watching this pre-talk. My takeaway message from Professor Waldemar is that living, breathing human beings are making decisions about every business, non-profit organization, or government body, and their judgments are ultimately the basis for sustainability. Please stay well, both mentally and physically, everyone. Don't forget to subscribe to the APO YouTube channel so that you don't miss out on our future discussions of current productivity topics. Thank you, David. I appreciate it very much. I hope we can see you in person one day. Thank you. I hope so, Professor. Yeah. yeah.